in four. I mean, the other the other way of looking at this would be the um, uh, what was you know when I'm listening to you was sort of been suggested to me was um, in Wittgenstein. In, Wittgenstein, in Wittgenstein, you have the thought that um, the point is to leave everything as it is. Right? So, but there's Wittgenstein. We we begin by being bewitched by certain pictures of language, the mind, world, and the rest. So that's what has to be criticised in order to see the world as it is. But that wouldn't be reproduction, would it? Would reproduction be reproduction of the world with a difference? Repetition with a difference? Is that the idea? I think so, yes. But I would think that the reason I'm, in this case, I'm supposed I'm referencing now that we in some of the numbers, mm -hmm. um, is that, yes, there will be differences, but they're not, essentially, it's not bringing, any, bringing forth any truth. And so, there will be differences, perhaps, within reproduction, but it's not bringing forth necessarily any truth. Yeah. Versus emancipation, I would see yeah. any truth. in the Yucatan a couple of days ago. <laughs> my wife was reading She's a Shrek. You're a complete shame. <laughs> she was reading Badgie's book on Deleuze. And uh, out loud in the car. The Jeep. Dancing along these roads. And uh, in many ways that's Deleuze. That's Badgie's question to Deleuze in many ways. That, that for Deleuze, yeah, there wouldn't be any change. The question of, you know, it would be um, everything is there in a sense latently. So, so when Badgie calls, um, he calls uh, Deleuze at the end of that book a physiologist. He calls it, it's, it's physician. That's translated physician, but the, he's, the claim is that uh, Deleuze is going back to that pre-philosophical tradition of the, of the physiologi, you know, the philosophers who are concerned with nature as a whole. Where there would be no event, as it were, in, there would be no event as a surplus to that which is, there's just that which is in its unfolding effulgence, as it were. More and more of it, more and more imminent, as it were. Whereas for bad you, there has to be a supplement to that which is which is the event. Right? So we get that distinction, say, between... So Deleuze's riposte to Badiou was to call him, uh, apart from calling him a Bolshevik, <laughs> he called him a fascist, right, at one point, uh, a neo-Kantian, meaning that for Badiou, there is that which is, which is uninteresting. <coughs> Philosophy is... Philosophy has no role talking about that which is. That which is is explained by mathematics. Philosophy can give us. Philosophy can describe the formal con conditions under which something arises, which is in excess of that which is, which is the event. The Deleuze that wouldn't be necessary. So that, there's, a, there's a difference there. But I'd argue that for, for Deleuze, I'd, I'd argue that you know, also you mentioned Agamben. Agamben. You know, who you were, what did he talk about? <laughs> the work of man. The work of man. I dress in politics. Literature, potentiality, I dress. What? I dress in the work of man. Yeah. Very much. Well, um, the way I understand, well, I don't know, it's up to is you know, there we get a critique of praxis right? insofar as um, <coughs> praxis is defined, say, by biopower, biopower right? the erasions of the biopower. Or, um, so what, what's, what's compelling about Agamben is that you know, a number of things. We get this Heideggerian uh, sweep of history from the 
the Greeks to the Romans to the present, with this sort of Foucauldian emphasis on genealogy. But the, the methodology is always formal, philological, and, and legal. He's always after the legal, formal points, which then lead to the most extraordinary generalizations, which are compelling power, um, although it's tendentious in it. That's the critique part, praxis. And then, usually at the end of the books, you get some indication of what emancipation might look like, which for him is always bound up with the relationship of law to life. So, so, so the point being is that you know, although Agathe then wouldn't talk about emancipation in those terms, uh, there's something that has that role, namely that if the history, if the history of uh, the West is, if the history of the West is the policing of life through law, basically it's thesis, and that law is essentially an act of violence, then what can be hoped for is some sort of uncoupling of law and life, which you'll call praxis, uh, or pure means. You'll refer to Aaron's, you'll refer to Benjamin, on divine violence, and then the books will think at that point. Or there's this fascinating reading of Aristotle you get in, you know, you know I can bear, I do potentiality. The point being, it's the same structure of the agenda, although the, the, not that these terms are used. Uh, is that helpful? Um, so the point being is, that I'm not saying that critique, practice, and emancipation are a grid that can be uh, laid over all these figures, but something that has that shape is operative in pretty much everyone. <coughs> Or think about, you know, uh, think about Bad Hughes' book on St. Paul. We begin with this uh, diagnosis of where we are. Um, you know, capital, capitalo parliamentarism, um, uh, liberalism, neo-Kantianism, and all the rest. It begins with these, sort of, you know, large uh, gestures. And then we go into a reading of Paul, which is what? Is, is, a, is a philological reading of Paul to some extent? But he's trying to unearth a sort of potentiality in the text of Paul. Uh, and Paul becomes for him a figure of the militant, a figure of the, the revolutionary. So I think that would work I mean, pretty much precisely in terms of the model I'm trying to use here. So, what, so you know, you begin from uh, a critique of praxis and uh, what's, what's up and what what that critique engages in is, is a form of reactivation of the past, uh, which unleashes, unleashes a potentiality, often in relationship to a, a text, which can be, which can, uh, which can guide a way of thinking in the present. That's the, that's the structure I'm trying to tease out. Um, in this model of critique, praxis, and emancipation, and uh, later we talked about philosophy being a collective practice. Yes. Um, it's like the um, those Renaissance portraits of the, uh, the Annunciation, where the Virgin Mary and Archangel Gabriel, and, and Mary's there. She, and in some of them, you get the what's called the Logos Spermaticos, the, as it were, the divine word comes from the angel and enters the ear of Mary, so she's inseminated through the ear. Um, Philosophy is like that. It's communication, as it were, at that, that level. It's a source of um, oral insemination. Um, Plato's Phaedrus is about nothing else. In the paradox, 
the, one of the paradoxes of philosophy, maybe the paradox of philosophy, is that we have these texts, fragments, you know, but we have a certain number of platonic dialogues, uh, a good number, um, where what is consistently criticised is communication through text and through writing. Writing is inauthentic, secondary. Writing is, um, yeah, writing is bad memory. Uh, philosophy is the activity of true memory, which is activated in living speech. So it's the pure form of communication through the voice, right? which is the voice <coughs> of the master to the disciple. And what the master is finding in the disciple, the student, the, the older man, the younger man, that model, is something which is already there, something which has already been communicated. Another paradox, right? So, I'm not an expert on Plato by any means, but <coughs> as you've just been, <laughs> been taught by Baju, it's sort of interesting to think about these things. You know, uh, in the Mino, um, uh, in order to prove his point, Socrates engaged in a geometrical demonstration with a slave. Again, it's not a neutral example, it's a slave. Um, in order to show that um, even a slave can come to the correct conclusions given the right premises. Namely that they're latently there. So all that communication does, all the philosophical, the, the classical model is that philosophical communication is the reactivation of what is potentially there in the soul. Right? But this all happens through a logical speech. And therefore, writing is what should be avoided at all costs. Now, this is what Derrida um, called logocentrism. The primacy which is centered on the logos and also phonocentrism. It's, it's not just, it's, it's the it's reason, it's logos, it's, it's, it's logos as communicated through the voice. Right? So philosophy, philosophy is, the, is pure, pure uncontaminated communication. That's the idea. Now I'm very suspicious of that. to say the least. But, you know, it's already, you know, philosophy begins with that idealization of the situation of speech, but it's already situated in a text which is iterated, which is disseminated, which is dead, which is virtual, which is, you know, a 5th century BC iPad or whatever within a circulation of texts in a certain space. So, something like that. That's the more question. I said some preposterous things. <laughs> well, I was just going to ask you, I don't know if we have to go on in this later in the seminar, but if you can go on with the suspicions that you have, because we've actually, in some of our classes, have hit on like the, the Plato with the slave, the insemination of the ear, the mm -hmm. Platon, close by that, by you told So we're, we're already in this place, so I'm really interested to hear about some of these suspicions, unless it's going too soon. Well, which suspicions? The, of the communication of this being this pure oral. Well, it's the, you know, it's the, um, um, It's not just it's not just philosophy. I mean, it, you know, in the sense in which there's there's a, there's a you know, the cultures of orality, the, the sacredness around orality is something which is you know incredibly can be generalised in a whole number of contexts. Suspicions around writing, or secrecy around writing, um, and you know we've got. But um, the uh, if we think about a text like text, like Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, the, um, what ph philosophy is this activity of, of dialogue, I and mean, I'm suspicious of, of that too, but the, it's the activity of, of dialogue. Um, but the highest dialogue is the dialogue of the soul with itself. So uh, 
Aristotle, in Book 10 of the Ethics, says that the highest form of existence is the bios theoreticos, the contemplative life, uh, which is the pure enjoyment of the soul communicating with itself. So the dialogue of us with each other gives way to the dialogue of the soul with itself, and that becomes the highest form of communication. So um, uh, you could say that the in the dominant strand of the philosophical tradition, there is an idealization of transparent self-communication right, as being the highest form of enjoyment. Then we need to think about what levels of mediation, virtuality and the rest make that possible, what, what those conditions of uh, possibility are for that, which, which render that ideal problematic. Like this. I, agree, yeah. I, mean, I don't know, we could say, well, here we have a model of the school. Mm -hmm. right? Here we have, as it were, a classical, the most classical model of uh, the school, which would be entirely recognisable to someone three millennia ago. They probably I think, they wouldn't recognise the buildings or whatever, the ski lodges, but they would probably work <coughs> out what was going on in this sort of context. You know, it's not unlike what. Plotinus was doing it in Alexandria, you know, by all accounts. Again, didn't write. Plotinus wrote nothing. You know, very poor eyesight, just spoke. And people then wrote it. So that idealization of uh, philosophical communication. Um, so uh, there's the school activity. There's the, um, the, idea, the idea of you know, philosophy as an activity that's done in the hills is also interesting. There's a history to that. There's probably plague in the cities, or war, or people being <laughs> tortured or torn to pieces. There's all of that. And there's the, the, the luxury of this situation, mm. um, which we could think about uh, at all sorts of levels. I mean, Hobbes' Leviathan, which is a great read, um, has this extraordinary critique of philosophy. He says that philosophy is just surplus value, which is luxury. Right? It's what, at certain points in culture, luxury becomes available, people start to philosophize. To attribute too much importance to that is delusional. Um, people go off into the hills and do that. Uh, so there's that, that model. Uh, the idea that philosophy can engage in the public realm, it depends what day it is, really. I mean, you know, I, for reasons of uh, narcissism, vanity, and to piss people off, this, this adventure with the, the New York Times is in the stone. I've been writing this last last few months. That's been a lot of fun. Um, but the, the interesting thing, well, there's a number of interesting things. It, it, you, know, you, you get this volume, because we get the stats on the readership, and it's, it, it, it's extraordinary, right? which, is, which is great. Most of it's silent. You don't know what people are thinking. You don't know whether things are being read. Um, so what, what's most interesting in that regard is looking at the comments. You know? So, for example, there was a Peter Singer blog that went up, and there were a thousand comments within um, within two or three hours, and they're crazy, <laughs> but crazy in a really interesting way. And you begin to see what people are thinking and the range of so. I mean, what would be, you know, I'm not someone with a bit of time on their hands and a bit of anthropological, you know, now. It'd be interesting just to, 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 to go through those things and find out the different strands, right? There's the sort of, there's the Dawkins, you know, science, there's sort of the evangelical atheism, science is right, you know. Uh, there's the, there's the, the disappointed liberal, um, we hope so, for so much from Obama. And there's the, there's the, there's the totalitarian Buddhists. That will appropriate anything. It's astonishing. You could throw anything out there. And, oh, of course, that's the. <laughs> anyone that's studied twenty years of Buddhism will know exactly. This is, this is exactly what you'll find in any. And uh, and then the Christian fundamentalists, and you see this range of opinion. What does that mean? I don't know. It's a blob. It's chaos. You know. Um, then, you, but then what? Then you're into some. Weird set of elitist arguments saying, well, philosophy then has to be this 
measured activity that's conducted in the hills or in the, in the academy under restrained conditions where only certain things could be thought. Then what separates this from um, what's going on in a department of Princeton or whatever? Um, then we need to, to think about that quite carefully. So, um, I don't know, I, I think that the, I mean, the, the idea of, um, I mean, there's a, there's a sense in which what I'm interested in with this, this New York Times thing is just seeing how far you can push, push the thing and see whether readers will, will go along with that. Uh, I'm sort of, um, at this point, agnostic. The future of philosophy, um, I think the future is something that, I'll, I'll say this later on, I think the future is something we should not think about. I think, you know, it's the, um, there's this quote from Benjamin, which I like, which, you know, which is, uh, revolution is a, is a tiger's leap into the past. I mean, that's always the way. So when I was talking about historicity, it's very much that in mind. I think the, the, the future is, the, the question of the future is, is either a question which is hijacked <coughs> by a certain capitalist narrative of progress, or it's a question which invites paralysis. That's great. Everyone's dead. The future is shit. Was that view, or all the future with the triumphal march of you know uh, liberal democracy, or in twenty years the scientists will get it right, like a full picture of how the brain functions, and well now which part of the brain functions in relation to happiness and all the rest. So I think that the as it were the the philosophical discipline is as it were. Uh, refusing to engage with the question of the future and engaging with the engaging with the present in relationship to the radical potential of the past. That's the way that's the way I want to think about it. Um, subjective transformation, I mean what I think is most um, I mean I found uh, I, mean, I started to read Bad Hughes work carefully in the early nineties when it wasn't being read much, because I was frustrated with a certain um, a certain melancholic, deconstructive um, prolixity. If that makes any sense to anybody. Yeah. <laughs> and what you had in, in Baiji was an extraordinary economy, abstract, formal economy. Here are the problems, here are the solutions, and here are some solutions. And he gave you ways of uh, models for thinking. I found that enormously refreshing. I still do. The central question, then is the question. You know, Badu's, <coughs> Badu's central question is incredibly simple. It's, you know, what is the new? Right? What is creation? That's, that for him is the issue. And uh, how, how does newness come into the world? That's really it. That's a question of subjective transformation, because that which is, and this is where this is where his, um, you know, the founding dualism of his work begins to get its get its bite. That which is, in a sense, is uninteresting. Right? It's the situation, or the state of the situation, is the way things are. Right? His question, the question which '68, as it were, uh, prompts in him is how can we think about newness, novelty, subjective transformation. That leads to the category of the event. So, and I see the, the four conditions of philosophy in bad view, art, science, politics, and, and love are all circle around the question of subjective transformation. What's meant by subject, of course, is not individual. This is always what's mistaken. To become subject is to become more than one of necessity to become two, or at least two in the act of love, to become an association in politics or a movement in, in connection with art or whatever. So, um, I find that incredibly powerful. It's, it's an awful lot more I can say about it. Therefore, the fact that he would choose Paul as his philosophical or his anti-philosophical model is, is interesting because what is Paul about? Paul is really about the act of subjective transformation. 
the transformation from Saul, the persecutor of Jewish Christians, to Paul, um, who writes letters to the churches. So it's now you know, another question. This is something maybe we can ask him later on, or, or not. It, it's the um, the relation of that that model of subjective transformation, whether that can be, as it were, you know, how that's to be how that's to be to be thought. Um, I'm enough of a Freudian and enough of a mired enough in psychoanalysis to uh, to sometimes have doubts about the capacity of the transformation. We put it another way. I mean, there's there's a there's a something I've claimed about Badgie, which I'm not sure whether I want to defend now, but let's, I'll just say it. Is his work is structurally Christian. Structurally Christian in the sense in which, in the sense in which what we're getting pulled is model of the tra- is, is the model of transformation from the individual to the subject, from soul to Paul. Um, so one becomes something new, resurrection, whatever. Uh, there are other models of thinking the subject uh, which will have a rather different character. Um, and I've I've got an idea somewhere in something I wrote about what I call structural Judaism. And structural Judaism would be the idea that one does not become a new subject. All the changes is one's relationship to the subjectivity that one has, the facticity that one has. There's a fascinating little essay by Emmanuel Levinas called Etre Juif, Being Jewish, which he suppressed. He wrote in 47. And he said... Um, what does it mean to be Jewish? To be Jewish is to have, despite oneself, a relationship to the law. Right? Right? So one is a Jew, whether one likes it or not. One is a Jew. You can decide, as it were, you can be a good Jew or a bad Jew, religious Jew or a irreligious Jew. It doesn't stop you being a Jew. Right? So your identity, your subjectivity, is constituted by what highly will call a facticity which marks you despite yourself. And transformation would just be transformation in relationship to that past that you are. That's more, that's the, that's the view that I tend to have. Um, there's a tendency, uh, it's, it's you is too clever to, to, to fall prey to this, but it's a tendency which you can see there of, as we're being entirely remade, being, being made entirely new. And uh, I don't think that's. I think I think you know, subjective transformation is always in relationship to uh, a fact, uh, the, the being that the, the one is. One can have a different orientation towards that, but it's still, it's still you. Which is which is more the more the psych, as I understand, more the psychoanalytic model. The same old shit. Right? You are like the same old worthless piece of shit that you were when you suffered more. Maybe you can suffer less. Maybe. Okay. Um, so philosophy is this on this model as an activity of um, all of this is book, you know, that I mean Bad and GJ came out last year with policy on philosophy in the present, which is I think the essay by Bad in that the formulation is something like the philosophy um, penetrates beyond opinion. A little bit of a phallic metaphor, but there we are. It's an activity of raising questions of a general form that penetrates beyond beyond opinion, doxa. Um, now, as I was saying before, I mean, there are different ways of, of conceiving uh, that. And the way I conceive of philosophy is beginning in disappointment. <laughs> what I mean by disappointment is um, I'll, I'll make clear in a, in a moment but in many ways this is the um, you could say the Kantian the Kantian version of, of philosophy namely that to philosophize is to know one's limits right? to philosophize is to know one's limits uh, in the preface to the second edition of the Critique of Pure Reason, Kant says that the uh, he tried to, or is it the first preface? I think. Yeah. 
it, he tried to draw tight uh, the limits of knowledge in order to make room for faith. To draw tight the limits of knowledge in order to make room for faith. So for, for, for Kant, the terror is the terror of fanaticism, which would be the domination of uh, reason by, by affect. And it's the terror of Spinozism. Um, Spinozism in the sense in which this would be the other, the other way you can think about where philosophy begins. Um, the Kantian version is to is that we have to acknowledge the limitations of what human beings are capable of in order then to go on to the more important questions of, uh, of, uh, of practical life. The Spinozist uh, will refuse limitation. And you can say that the history of philosophy, one of the, the junction points in the history of philosophy is around this question of limitation. Does philosophy begin with an act of limitation, or is it a refuse of limitation? And um, the, 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 the late 20th century version of that opposition, I think, would be the difference between uh, Derrida's um, habits of thought and Deleuze's habits of thought. So in a sense, in Derrida, there's always a constant obsession with the limit right? and a critique of where the limit might lie. And if someone claims to go beyond the limit, like Bataille or like Foucault, Derrida would draw them back in. So you can't do that. You can't, you can't step beyond into non-knowledge, absolute sovereignty, no way. You're drawing on the resources that you're trying to deny. If anyone tries to reassert those limits in the most closed way, Derrida will say, no, you can't do that either. The discourse in and of itself deconstructs itself. So deconstruction in many ways is a discourse uh, around the limit. The other tendency is the refusal limitation. Right? That what is, is an abundant, effulgent, infinite sphere of, of imminence, which we, can, we need to affirm, and which uh, the correct use of the understanding, in Spinoza's term, term, can give us intuition. The choice as to which way to go is a choice. This is not, um, as it were, an axiomatic, deductive decision. I mean, these, these, as I've tried to say before, I mean the um, those those two choices, the choice of limitation or refusal of limitation, are cho choices which are both powerfully available and have to be um, felt as, as seductions, as temptations on one's thought. I think. <coughs> But I want to begin from the postulate of, of disappointment. Um, now, the two forms of disappointment that um, I want to begin with are religious and political disappointment. There are different forms of disappointment, but let me start with these, these two, because these are the two main ones that I try and work with. <coughs> religious disappointment is born from the realisation that religion is no longer capable of providing a meaning for human life. That the, um, in the, the great metaphysical comfort of religion resides, I think, in the claim that the meaning of human life lies outside of life and outside our humanity. And we can either uh, claim to know cognitively that outside point, knowledge of God, or we can turn our faith in the direction of the divine. For me, philosophizing begins from the literal incredibility of that claim. So philosophy begins um, from the breakdown of the possibility of um, a belief in God or some God equivalent. Um, now, 
let me just sketch. I mean, one thing to make clear is that I don't. Um, so, the position I want to argue for uh, philosophy being disappointment, religious disappointment, is um, is atheism. You know, so, so philosophy begins from um, uh, a conception of the death of God, but it's not a contented atheism. It's not the atheism, say, of a, a Dawkins or a, a Hitchens that uh, Terry Eagleton fused into one being called Ditchkins. <laughs> Ditchkins, yeah. Uh, so, it's, you know, a contented atheist has no reason to bother themselves with philosophy, it seems to be. Uh, philosophy is just a cultural distraction or a technical means of sharpening one's common sense. So, uh, on this, on this view, uh, religion is hugely important. So religious disappointment is the idea that the uh, um, philosophy as an activity uh, cannot function with religion, but cannot function without religion. So there's not, as it were, you know, a heroic throwing off of our religious past. We have to recognize that what was being articulated under the name of religion in all of its various forms were possibilities say, of subjective transformation and the rest which are still valuable and give access to a, sort of a, uh, a subjective depth which is often missing in forms of um, contented atheism. Um, the problem that that religious disappointment uh, gives rise to is the question of meaning. If, if uh, for the theist, if the meaning of life lies outside of life, then once that's broken down, the question of meaning becomes a question. Right? What is the meaning of life in the absence of, the, of any transcendent guarantee? Right? What might the meaning of life be uh, given, given that, that that thing that we thought guaranteed uh, a meaning to life has become unbelievable. Right? You see where this is going to move towards Nietzsche very, very quickly. I just want to say a word about that at this point, because it might be illuminating. I mean, Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's thought here is in, incredibly compelling. You know, it's not that um, God is dead, it's God is dead and we have killed him, right? It's not that uh, God is dead, hurrah. It's rather that the, the process of historical unfolding or degeneration has led to a situation where belief in God has broken down. Why is that? Um, Nietzsche says it's because Christianity was motivated by a will to truth. Right? What does that mean? Uh, Christianity uh, was not content with the idea that the world is a world of appearances, a veil of illusions, and blah, blah, blah. Christianity had the idea that there was a true world, that true world was, was beyond, and that we could have access to it uh, through, through faith, and maybe even through the afterlife. The death of God, then, is the idea that the, the will to truth that defines Christianity has flipped over into its inverse. The will to truth that uh, motivates Christianity has discovered that what Christianity believed in as true is untrue. God is dead. Right? Um, this leads to the problem of nihilism for Nietzsche. So, Religious to point out what is the meaning of life in the absence of some god uh, or god equivalent, the problem of nihilism. What is the problem of nihilism? The formula for nihilism that, and this, this is just great, this is from Will to Power. Nietzsche writes, I've got that scene in that multi-platform, Nietzsche says, 
not to esteem what we know and not to be allowed to esteem the lies we should like to tell ourselves. Not to esteem what we know and not to be allowed to esteem the lies we should like to tell ourselves. We know uh, that there is no God. Um, we could tell ourselves all sorts of weird shit that would replace that uh, belief in God, but we can't believe that either. Right? So there is this, as it were, fundamental sort of tail-biting paradox at the core of, uh, uh, this is the situation of nihilism for, for Nietzsche. Um, the other way he formulates it is to say that um, nihilism is that the, the highest values have devalued themselves. The aim is lacking, why finds no answer. The highest, value de highest values devalue themselves. Does the Augustan Werte sich entwerten uses the, the reflexive verb there? And what that means is that it's not that um, <coughs> we, we've declared that God is dead, you know, lucky us, but that the highest values have devalued themselves. Right? So the process of history is a process of the devaluation of values. Devaluation of values. And that's a situation that leads to the affirmation of nihilism. So who is the nihilist for Nietzsche? The nihilist is that being who accepts that the world is meaningless <coughs> and who affirms it. So the nihilist is that being who um, reacts to uh, the death of God by asserting meaninglessness. Right? I don't stand up for any particular point, just a sort of thing. <laughs> Um, so the nihilist is the person, in a sense, is the person who believed in God, who can no longer believe in God, finds the existence meaningless, and then affirms that meaninglessness. Now Nietzsche uh, takes that figure from, um, there's a whole philosophical history of nihilism which I could talk about, it's absolutely fascinating, but he takes that figure really from uh, the Russian novelists of the... Um, the late 19th century, Turgenev. He gets it direct from Turgenev's fathers and sons. Mm -hmm. but also, Dostoevsky is very important for, for Nietzsche. And if you look at Turgenev's fathers and sons, there's this character called Bazarov. And Bazarov is the nihilist who declares nothing is meaningless and our task is therefore to destroy. Okay? Destroy. Um, the Russian context is crucial. They talk about Nechayev's revolutionary catechism and Bakunin and all sorts of great stuff, but let's, let's um, we'll bring that up later on if we can. So, problem nihilism. Uh, then there are different forms of nihilism. And this is very much, these, these are categories that you can find in, in Nietzsche, but which I sort of try to mobilize in, a, in an independent way. Um, the passive nihilist is the person who, um, the passive nihilist, or what, what Nietzsche calls the European form of Buddhism, the European form of Buddhism, or the American form of Buddhism. Um, it's, the, it's the position that Nietzsche associates with Schopenhauer. Right? The world is an illusion. It's an illusion which is, which is driven by this merciless, rapacious will, which simply wills, and there's no point of stability. Right? There's, no, there's no anchor. What does one do in the face of that? Well, um, nothing. Don't worry, be happy. Stay in bed. Right? Oblomov, the character of Oblomov. And I think this is, I think passive nihilism has got a lot going for it. I mean, I'm not a passive nihilist. Um, but I think it's a, 
an understandable response to the world we have. Um, the world is blowing itself to pieces in an orgy of inequality. The future is a future, what do we say? Religious war and environmental devastation. At the least. In the face of that, what do you do? Withdraw. Make yourself into an island. Go to the top of the hill. Take up. Say a little prayer to the obscure but benign Eastern goddess and feel some weak spiritual energy connecting everything together as we listen to some tastefully selected ambient music. <laughs> or, while I was on vacation, B. Tulum. There was this extraordinary hotel called B. Tulum. Uh, you couldn't, it was this fusion of, you know, uh, sort of new age with, you know, utter. Uh, orgy of inequality and the whole thing was based around this, as it were, a well-being, the idea of well-being, feeling of one, turtles, nature, sky, union, authenticity, peace. There's a war going on. <laughs> Mexico, is a, Mexico is on fire. You can retreat to the beach and feel the oneness. That's passive nihilism. Uh, and there's an awful lot to be said for that. And I think, you know, one of the things, <laughs> one, one of the thoughts I'd like to, 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 to leave you with at the end of this course would be, you know, what are there reasons not to be a passive nihilist at this point <laughs> in, in history? Um, I think there are very good, compelling reasons to be a passive nihilist. If we say, well, all this, the global projects of emancipation have failed, um, you know, all this talk of communism, just so much manneristic, blah, 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 for God's sake. You know, you know what? You know, the, the, we have a, a top-down, authoritarian capitalism which is ravaging nature and the clock is ticking and the whole thing is going up. Right? And in the face of that, just, just be. And the question, though, um, again, the guy with this New York Times thing, this, this was... Peter Singer then raised in this, this, this column the, the Schopenhauerian uh, issue, the Schopenhauerian question. I said, well, but then why have children? What, what possible ethical motivation would there be to have kids? Isn't the only authentic moral start at this point in history to stop reproduction? <laughs> this would be the sort of children of men hypothesis, but you know, in a different sort of way. Passive Active nihilism, which I've not explained, is the same situation. The world is meaningless, <clears throat> but response, destroy it. Um, take it. Take it down. Um, and there's a whole um, fascinating genealogy of active nihilism, which we could, which we could talk about, which goes through the Russian anarchists. If, you, if, you, if, you, if you're online, I mean, if you, Nechaya, um, <coughs> Nechaya, it's like, you've got, it's anarchy archives, it's, you've just got Nechaya revolutionary catechism, there's a version online I know because I've looked at it recently. It's a great example of active nihilism. I tried, I've tried to tell a story that connects up late 19th century forms of active nihilism in the form of terrorism right the way through to um, situationism and beyond. There's this great statement by, you know, people always read Guy Debord, but Raoul van Eigen, sort of situations number two is fascinating. There's this phrase of Van Eigen, which is, uh, which is uh, the quintessence of active nihilism, which is creativity plus a machine gun is an unstoppable combination. Right? Creativity plus a machine gun is an unstoppable combination. Or, you know, in 68, 
uh, Sully Palace in a flash under the paving stones it's a beach therefore pick up the rocks and throw them on the cliffs Kedishism destruction hmm? Kedishism of the revolutionist yes yeah it's there in um, grey um, and I've tried to argue in infinitely demanding and I'm not sure how far I want to I, c I can justify it but I think I now want to nuance it a bit more looking at uh, groups like Al-Qaeda and related groups under the heading of active nihilism. Because the interesting thing, if you read, if you read the statements of Osama bin Laden, which were published, Universo did this brilliant edition about four or five years ago, and you read them carefully as texts, you see that there's a sort of, um, there's, there's, I mean, obviously there's the, um, the usual sort of, what we associate with jihadism in that rather uh, uninteresting way. But there's the complete absence of a social program right, in Bin Laden. There is a sort of a heroic, um, uh, a, a heroic um, theology of martyrdom, right, of sacrifice, uh, a clear idea of who the enemy is uh, and what needs to be done in order to undermine the enemy. But it sort of ends there. It's not like Hezbollah, which has a very different say, set of uh, policies as to how, you know, how to how to govern how to govern a, a, a state or a region. <coughs> Active nihilism. The question, which is a good question, well what's um, we could blur that a little bit. And this is where we can come to um, slavling. <coughs> uh, we'll, and we'll come back to him because um, if we read the uh, the book on violence um, and other things, Parallax View, a whole number of other texts, you know, but quite a few. <laughs> um, the the problem with contemporary ideology is its insistence on activity. Okay? Um, I mean, fuck, people are dying in Pakistan right now. We have to do something, you know? I was watching CNN. Look, we have to do something. We have to raise money. We have to get out there and do it, right? To sort this out. People are dying. The livelihoods are being destroyed. Families are being... It's awful. Zizek will say this is the ideology of, 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 you know, of, of, of late capitalism. This endless injunction towards activity. A useless injunction towards activity. Which disguises a sort of thinly disguises a sort of conformism. In the face of that, what does one do? Well, nothing. He will say, um, you know, revolution was at the gates. You know, um, I forget which example of words of Marx. You know, Marx you know, said, "Well, I can't they wait a bit longer until I finish capital?" Or, you know, when is the moment of the possibility of the Bolshevik Revolution before it actually happens. You know, Lenin goes off and reads Hegel's logic. That, that's Zizek's counsel. In the face of that ideology of activism, you withdraw. And the figure for that is Bartleby. Okay? Melville's Bartleby. Um, so, if you know this story by Melville, <coughs> we could have a, we could spend a week on Melville. That would be a lot of fun. I'd like to do that. You know, we have this enigmatic figure of Bartleby, a fable, of, a tale of Wall Street. After all, it's, it's in the context of uh, mid 19th century emergent New York financial capitalism. This figure, who is a figure of refusal, I would prefer not to. Um, and what Zizek picks out of that is, the, is both the refusal and the sort of latent violence of the refusal. So, the, so you know, this, so I mean, philosophy is about taxonomy and neat categorizations, which you then can blur. So passive nihilism, active nihilism. But we could put something in between the, um, a Bartlebyan uh, position, which would be a sort of withdrawal, a withdrawal with, with the threat of violence. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the way I read Zizek is the. Um, is that the um, the governing fantasy 
The governing fantasy of Zizek's work is Bartleby plus uh, the Norman Bates character from Cypher. Okay? Fusion of those two beings. And so we get both the, as were, the withdrawal with the threat of cataclysmic violence. And he keeps coming back to that murder scene where it's, uh, who is it that's Jandley? Jandley? Jandley is, I mean, yeah, extraordinary. <clears throat> and this would be, in his terms, divine violence. I'll criticize this on Sunday, but there we are. It's, it's, a, it's without the bitterloom, you know, everything's connected, authenticity, well-being, but it's not, it's not this activity. Um, regarding active nihilism, um, I was wondering how you make the distinction between wanting to destroy this world and bring about another and wanting to change this world. Well, or do you not make that distinction? It, 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 it is a distinction. And it's a, it's a difficult distinction to make. Yeah. It's, um, it's a good question. Um, so to avoid it, <laughs> which I'm very skilled at doing at certain points, so the question is really hard, is to, um, you know, what does Nietzsche do? Well, he says, he adds a third category. There's, 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 act, there's active nihilism, there's passive nihilism. You know, don't worry, be happy, uh, make yourself into an active nihilism, which he associates with uh, the Russian anarchism, as the term was used in, in, in his day. Uh, there's a third option, which he calls um, a shabby dissolution, where society no longer has the strength to excrete it's a third option, which I can't really categorize, but this would be this sort of inability to excrete response to nihilism. Constipated nihilism. Constipated Put that in here. CP. Oh, CN, sorry. CNN. Neo nihilism. Um, I'm so pleased with myself, I forgot the question. <laughs> Distinction between... Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> so, the, uh, <clears throat> I mean, Nietzsche's... Nietzsche's um, so Nietzsche uh, sets up the issue in this way. Uh, it's indeed true that God is dead, that the highest values have devalued themselves, but we mustn't affirm nihilism. What, what needs to be done is to engage in an activity of revaluation. Right? So the Nietzschean response is a revaluation of values. How do we understand that? Um, I mean, the jury is out on that. You know, I mean, reading Nietzsche is like reading Talmud. It's just you know, there are so many different ways of interpreting it. But <coughs> one line of interpretation that I'm I'm persuaded by because it's mine is the, um, the idea that what Nietzsche's asking... Nietzsche's, Nietzsche um, has this idea of eternal return. And by eternal return, he, he suggests... I think he calls it the antithesis of Spinozism, or the, the inverse of Spinozism, something like that. So Spinozism is the idea that the universe is the cosmos is one vital surge of life. Right? You have that idea. And I can connect with that through the understanding. Nature. Wonderful. For Nietzsche, it's the opposite. The universe is entirely meaningless. Right? It's just, it's like Pascal's uh, silence of infinite spaces. There's just an empty, meaningless void. Um, If I can will that realization, existence without aim, purpose, or meaning, and if I can will that over and over again, I'm getting close to the idea of eternal return. Right? So eternal return becomes this, this as it were, super moral act of, uh, 
of accepting the universe as it is and uh, attempting to engage in an act of, uh, of commitment, the aim of which is some form of autonomy. Or again, forget autonomy. I was reading on the beach <coughs> in, um, in, in Tulum, um, which is a very interesting thing to read, uh, Bataille is a Cursed Share, Volume 3, The Accursed Share, which is, which is I mean, you know, I've not really looked at that for Bataille for a long time. And in Bataille's A Cursed Share, which is on, is on sovereignty, it's on the idea of sovereignty. So what Bataille takes out of Nietzsche is the idea of the sovereign. And sovereignty is the, um, for Bataille, is the, the acceptance of the, 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 the world as it is, as a, a fairly <coughs> dreadful, repugnant place, and yet the possibility, uh, the, sorry, the, the resolution to, um, the resolution to cultivate certain sovereign moments of autonomy which he associates with eroticism, tragedy, the comic, laughter, excess, the luxury. Interestingly, that's the category we think about in relation to Bataille, squandering. What Bataille is against is the principle of utility and usefulness. What he's in favour of is people that squander. So in a sense, there's a sort of cultivation of luxury. So, um, but that is an example. That would be a, a way of accepting the... Um, um, the death of God, but refusing to embrace nihilism. Now, what I'm going to try and do 